Hi, I'm Matt Welch for Reason TV. I'm here at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas with Cato Institute Executive Vice President David Bose. David, thanks for joining us. We're here at the Freedom Fest talking about whether we're uh, at the, you know, we're seeing uh, Rome Part Two, whether it's the decline of the United States. Uh, yet a lot of people that I've uh, talked to around um, have been speaking about 2013 being more of a kind of uh, li extended libertarian Christmas ever since the uh, Rand Paul filibuster and a series of uh, government scandals has been sort of pushing more people into a, uh, a libertarian direction. Are we finally living in a libertarian moment, David Bose? Well, in a way we are. The problem is libertarian moments always come after the government seizes a huge new chunk of power. So, you know, we have the bailouts and the TARP and the stimulus bill, and suddenly there's a mass Tea Party movement. Unfortunately, we already got the bailouts and the TARP and the stimulus. Um, we had the same thing in 1994. Um, and now we're, we're having the reaction to the censor, the uh, stalking of journalists and the surveillance of all the rest of us and the IRS scandal. But unfortunately, it's because we found out they're doing all these things. So it's not like we've actually stopped very many of them. We've just created a libertarian moment where, boy, are we ticked off. Right. Uh, you know, the, you mentioned the Tea Party thing, right? So that's kind of a, a 2010, at least that's how it expressed politically in, a, in an election. How would you rate the performance of, let's say, the 2010 class? Did, did something sustain? Did we do, are we living with something new that didn't exactly uh, exist before uh, under the name Liberty Movement? I mean, are you... Are you optimistic? Yeah, I think there is more of a liberty movement. Um, Ron Paul's campaigns, Gary Johnson's campaign, the Tea Party, the marijuana liberalization and the marriage equality movements, those groups don't all agree with each other, but they pretty much all agree with libertarians. So yes, I think all of that is good and there is something more that you can call a liberty movement than you used to be able to. Um, is it sustainable? Well, that's always a challenge. People get angry and they go march in the streets and then they go home and keeping that anger and that energy going is difficult. And it's also difficult when you elect people to Congress to keep them on your team. And that's a little difficult to judge because you've got a Republican House that can pass anything it wants to but it isn't going anywhere else. Right. And so the result has sort of been gridlock which is better than Congress passing laws. I've seen some criticism of libertarianism this year, surprise, surprise. Uh, and one of them has been that there's no real governing program with it. It's a bunch of people saying no. Um, do you think that there's enough um, sort of members of a liberty movement where it's actually time to start talking about what would libertarian-ish people do when they govern? Is there more like a, a concrete policy discussion? I have the complete plan. <laughs> I edited the book, it's called the Cato Handbook for Policymakers, it's 67 chapters. You want to know what libertarians, if they controlled both houses of Congress, would do about taxes, entitlements, the war in Iraq? We have it all in the Cato Handbook for Policymakers. Now, that doesn't mean that there is any libertarian group of members of Congress ready to do that, right. but in that sense, there is a plan. I am all in favor of saying no. No is a good thing to say when you're a member of Congress. and. Politicians saying yes to war and taxes and spending and regulation is what got us into all this mess. So I'm all in favor of saying no. But if you want specific plans for how to walk our way back out of the social security mess, how to walk our way out of Iraq and Afghanistan, we have them. It's a huge disconnect right now between kind of bipartisan foreign policy consensus, Washington to the extent that that consensus exists, and American public opinion when it comes to the waging of foreign policy, when it comes to, you know, should we be funding people in Syria? How should we be dealing with Egypt? Um, where do you see public opinion trending on foreign policy issue? And are we getting to a place where it's easier to bridge that gap? Are we finally seeing some practical uh, impact of a, of a less robust interventionism going forward? Well, you would hope so. It's absolutely true that there's been a trend toward opposition to foreign adventurism. And yet in Washington, even in Washington, it's constrained. You don't see anybody saying, let's invade Libya and Syria. They're saying, mm, let's use drones, let's uh, create no-fly zones, let's give arms to the rebels. Dangerous things that led us into Vietnam that can lead you into wars, but 
they know the American people would not tolerate, let's just go in and fight a war in Syria. So I think public opinion is putting a constraint on what they're able to do. But it is absolutely true that among the political class, the neocons and the liberal internationalists, the liberal hawks, together they want to be active. What's the point of having this great military and being in government unless you're going around doing things both domestically and internationally? So the fact that the American people would just like to leave the rest of the world alone, um, it's tough to organize that sentiment. And then you have the partisan problem. Where's the anti-war movement since Barack Obama became president? Right. How much of all these kind of things, uh, foreign policy is a great example of it because we have we have the phrase military industrial complex. So we understand how there can be structural kind of interests that perpetuate this. How much in that, but also in other areas of government, do you attribute the continued growth of all of this stuff, at, you know, uh, despite public opinion? How much of it is like the structural complex that exists, that perpetuates, and how much is sort of public opinion that adheres you know, to these tribalistic political parties that, that will they'll therefore back Barack Obama doing the same policies as Dick Cheney. Uh, how, do you, how do you kind of judge that after uh, well, there are decades? Well, there are a variety of things. Uh, there certainly is the problem that when you promise people money and then you start giving it to them, it's very difficult to organize them to, to want to stop getting the money. So there's public support for things that help me. Um, there's also the public choice problem that the organized interests have more influence in Washington than the unorganized interests. So all the people out there who are paying a dollar or five dollars for each government program, very hard to get them excited about any one of them. Whereas the people who are getting the fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars for the farm program or the, uh, the tariffs or the Wall Street bailout, those people are organized and they're always working the halls of Washington and the, the, the bureaucrats themselves are working the halls of Washington. So the bureaucrats are a permanent lobby for more government. And trying to organize a Tea Party or an anti-war movement or anything else against that kind of permanent government is very difficult. And money permeates every part of the government. When Jim Gray said he was going to run for Congress on an anti-drug war platform, he said two Republican congressmen from California told him, I wish you well, be great to have a congressman up here who took on the drug war, but you're going to find that there's drug war money in every nook and cranny of the federal government, the education department, the interior department, the state department, and that means that every one of those departments and sub-departments is up on Capitol Hill lobbying against any change in the drug war. And that's also true for all the other things the government gets into, the money just kind of weaves itself in and out of all these different agencies. Very hard to break all that, unless you just have a general collapse. Uh, final question. You're from Kentucky, am I right? I about am. That's Senator Rand Paul's uh, home state. Uh, you've been uh, in libertarianism for a long time. Uh, Rand Paul this week got into some publicity hot water when an old uh, aide, co-author of one of his books, Jack Hunter uh, came out that his Southern Avenger days included uh, Confederate luchador masks and and uh, cheering John Wilkes Booth uh, every uh, every uh, Lincoln assassination anniversary. Why does this keep happening to libertarianism? Well, I don't know that it does keep happening to libertarianism. It does seem to keep happening to the Paul family. And so, what exactly the connection is there? I'm not sure. Uh, there are people who call themselves libertarians who somehow think Austrian economics and the uh, Southern Confederacy have something in common. I don't know what it is. The idea that there are people who can get upset about the Fed's expansion of its power and are blithely unconcerned about defending a government that was holding four million people in chains uh, up until the Civil War, I don't understand that kind of libertarianism. Now, in Jack Hunter's particular case, I've seen some writings that he did earlier this year where he seemed genuinely um, contrite about being a young jerk. Um, so I don't, so don't want to judge him personally. Um, it does seem like we, when we hire somebody at Cato, we run a Google search. You would think if you were a U.S. Senator and you ran a Google search, you might have wondered whether it was a good idea to hire somebody who says that every year he toasts the assassination of the president from Kentucky. 
Well, on that uh, cheery note, thank you, David Bose, for uh, joining you. us here. For Reason TV, I'm Matt Welch.